us the introduction to metabolism. You know a little bit about this already, so let's just do a quick review of this stuff, okay? Metabolism is all the chemical reactions in the body, whether you're building things or breaking things down or just changing things in general. So if we make things, build things, it's called anabolism, okay? This is making new bonds. And in order to do this, you're going to have to take out water we call this dehydration reaction. In order to do this, energy has to be put into it. You want to build something, you've got to put some energy into it. Okay? Then we have catabolism, like catastrophe. And this is where we're going to be breaking bonds, a decomposition reaction. Okay? In order to do this, we have to put water into it. So we're going to take H2O, we're going to put an OH on one structure and an H on the other structure. And usually when this happens, energy is released. Right? You take a, one of those big balls and smash it onto a building, all the smoke, all the energy is released from there. But when you build it, you have to put energy into this building to build it. So we use the Lego as a analogy to anabolism and catabolism. Okay? So now we look on a microscopic or a molecular level, and you can see over here. that if we have a polymer, a chain of some sort here, and we want to add something to it, we want to build bonds, combine them, then we're going to take an OH from one side over here, an alcohol a functional unit, right? Take that off, and a an hydrogen over here. That'll make water. Water comes out, and now we've got a bond here that can be merged. So when we want to build things, it's a dehydration reaction. We're going to dehydrate. We're going to take water out of that. As opposed to breaking things up, so now you have this long, this was kind of the reverse of this, right? So you have this long chain over here, this polymer. And we want to break off that pink ball over here. So we're going to need water to do that. An OH from water goes onto this brown one, and an H from the water goes onto the pink one, and you have that. And that. So in order to do that, we need to use water, but we have to break it up. <coughs> Hydrolysis, right? Hydrolysis. Hydro meaning water. Lysis, as you're learning now, lysis is the first. Break up that thing, okay? Factors that will speed up the process, all right? That will change the rate. If we increase temperature, the reaction rate will go faster. But we, again, we don't want to, we don't want the heat to go up too high where it's going to break up and denature enzymes because those enzymes, which also speed up the, the reactions, are now going to be broken up too. So in your body, you don't want high fever. You're thinking high temperatures are going to speed up things. Yes, but too much is going to destroy enzymes that you need for the reaction. So increasing temperature will increase the, re the reaction rate. If you decrease the particle size, and I use that example 
where if I take this structure, and what we have here is the surface area of this structure is the only part where things could actually touch. But if I break it up into two smaller products, I've also created two new surface areas over here. And if I break it up again, I created two new surface areas. I'm increasing surface area by breaking up the substance into smaller products. Does that make sense, right? You take an ice cube that's big, and you want to try to heat it, it will melt. You put it on a stove, it'll melt. But if you take that same ice cube, and you break it up into ice chips, and you put it on a stove, you've now increased the surface area, it's going to actually melt much, much faster. Also, if you increase the concentration of, let's say, the enzyme or something, that's going to also increase the reaction rate. And increasing specifically enzymes will also increase the reaction rate. Okay? You put, for the concentration, put more salt in a boiling, or let's say a, a pot of water, that will increase the, uh, the boiling uh, to occur faster, right? right? So, um, so those are factors that influence reaction rates. Now, on enzymes particularly, they are proteins that function as catalysts that are in biology, okay? They permit reactions to occur extremely fast. A reaction may take, let's say, eight or nine hours to do. An enzyme will then, when it gets involved, may make it go milliseconds. The substrate is the substance that the enzyme acts on. Okay? So if we're dealing with sucrose, a disaturide, a two-ring sugar, the sucrose, that sucrase, which is the enzyme, attacks or um, acts upon is the substrate, right? The sucrose is the substrate. What do enzymes do? They lower the activation energy. The activation energy is the energy needed to get that reaction started, okay? So again, I showed just before. If I need to take a ball, all right, now this is a, I'm using a ball as an analogy, but keep in mind, this is a graph. So if I need to get from here to here, and let's say there's a ball here, I have to go over that hump, and then it's going to go. This hump over here is the free energy that we'll be talking about. This is the activation energy. You need this much energy to make the reaction occur. What the catalyst does, or what an enzyme does, is that it lowers this activation energy to something that may look like this. Now, the ball, you don't have to use that much energy to get it up a hill. And that's what an enzyme does. It lowers the activation energy so that the reaction can happen much faster. You clear with that? Okay. Some, some new stuff now. An allosteric regulator. All right? A certain molecule binds to an enzyme at one site and then affects the enzyme's function at another site. Similar to this keyhole. Let's say this door handle and the locking mechanism is all an enzyme. Okay? So I'm going to take the key and I'm going to put it in the keyhole here. That's the allosteric regulator. In other words, I'm putting it over here, but that's going to change the structure on another side of this enzyme. Does that make sense? I'm not touching that side over there, but it changes it. So 
every enzyme has an active and inactive form. It can either inhibit or stimulate the enzyme. I can either lock the door or I could unlock the door, right? All right, some review on energy and a lot of new stuff. Potential energy is energy that matter possesses because of its location or structure. Think of a battery. When you buy a battery, it's not doing anything. It has potential energy. There's energy in there that has a potential to do something. When you put it into your phone or when you put it into a radio or whatever. Okay? Chemical energy is potential energy available for release in a chemical reaction. So that's more specific for chemical reaction. Okay? If I had the rubber band over here, and I stretch and I hold it there, that's potential energy. It's not chemical energy, because I'm not going to be doing any sort of chemical reaction with this when I let it go. Does that make sense? All right? Kinetic energy is energy that is associated with any kind of movement or motion. So when I let go of that rubber band, as it, as it shrinks down, it's releasing kinetic energy. Heat, i.e. thermal energy, is kinetic energy associated with random movement of atoms and molecules. Energy can be converted from one form to another. We could take kin kinetic energy and we could put it into potential energy. We could have potential energy and it could turn into kinetic energy. So like your Climbing up here and want to dive off, the person over here has potential energy when it when he jumps off of here, he's releasing kinetic energy. He's got to build his way up to get more potential energy and releases it as kinetic energy. Okay? Alright, now let's talk about thermodynamics and laws. Okay? Thermodynamics is a study of energy transformations, turning this energy into something else. A closed system is a system that's isolated away from the environment. A good example of this is a thermos. Thermos, if you know how a thermos is made, there's a container within a container, and there's space in between the two containers. Your food or your coffee or tea or whichever is actually in the inner area and it's away from the environment. It's closed on top and it's closed around it. So the outside environment should not affect the thermos and it can stay hot for eight hours. Even if you're in snow, right? An open system is us, organisms. Energy and matter can be transferred between system and its surroundings. We produce heat, it goes out into the environment. The environment has too much heat, it goes into us. Like a day like today, right? When it's 70 or 80 degrees. We feel that heat. So we got a couple of laws, and these are facts, right? We talked about hypothesis versus theory versus laws. A law is short and sweet. The conservation of energy. What it states is that energy cannot be created or destroyed. Okay? Energy, however, can be transferred, transferred and or transformed into something else. Okay? 
So we have this gasoline over here. You pour the gasoline into the car, and we can get that gasoline, which is basically potential energy. When it goes into the car, we can change it into kinetic energy so that the car moves. However, not all that potential energy went into the car to move it. In fact, very little of it does. 80% of it, in this case, is transferred into thermal energy, heat energy. And that's why the engine's hot. The engine's hot is not going to help you move the car. So most of the energy here is lost into the environment. Okay? The second law of thermodynamics. Energy conversion proceeds from more useful to less useful forms. It's not 100% efficient. Like I said, in the car, you lose that energy. All the gasoline is not used to move the car. Most of it is lost. It goes into the environment, and it messes up things. It makes the environment messier. Okay? So we have something called entropy. Be careful with the spelling of these words. Entropy. We're going to talk about entropy also. Entropy is whenever energy is used, the complexity and organization are lost. Things that are messy get messier. Unless you put work into it, but naturally it wants to get messier. So this is glucose, and this is oxygen. Okay? Pretty complex thing. Naturally, it wants to break up into simple things. <coughs> Carbon dioxide and water. Simpler things. But it's also releasing a lot of heat. What we're doing here is the start of what we call cellular respiration. Where we're going to take, in our bodies, in animals, we're going to take glucose and oxygen, the food that we eat and the air that we breathe, makes energy. We will use this energy, ATP. Water comes out, and a byproduct is the carbon dioxide. And the plants usually take the carbon dioxide to make their own food. So you get the same number of atoms over here, if you count the number of carbons and stuff like that, you get the same number, but overall increase into simple product molecules. They get simpler, not more complex, not bigger, okay? Energy must be added to the system to restore order. You want to make something bigger, you've got to put more energy in it. If there's no energy into it, it's going to get simpler, but it's going to go in the atmosphere or the environment or elsewhere and make things more complex. You can imagine what your desk looks like now taking biology. Right? You're so into studying, and the little time that you have to sleep and eat, you don't have enough energy to clean your desk. So you just throw things there, your mail goes on there, your books go on there. Things get messier, right? So the first law of dynamics is that this leopard, or cheetah, is going to eat this antelope. The antelope has potential energy that is now going into the cheetah. And the cheetah is going to 
save that potential energy until it needs to run. This becomes more complex because most of this, 20% of that energy goes into the movement of this, and I'm just giving percentages, like the car, but little energy is used to run, but most of the energy is going to be going out in the environment and make it messier. More heat that's going to go out there. Organisms use the sun's light energy to create low entropy conditions of light. Okay? So we're going to talk about that, how photosynthesis, the plants are going to take the energy from the, the sun and use that energy to make their own food. Plants can't go out, well, a few plants can, uh, Venus flytrap. But really, plants can't go out and munch on a hamburger like we can. So they have to make their own food to make energy, to make ATP. So energy flows into an ecosystem as light. We need the sun to actually start our food chain. The energy exits into the ecosystem as heat. So light comes in, builds our energy, but then when we get the energy, some of it turns into kinetic motion energy, but most of it gets released as heat back into the environment. And it gets messy there. So now we have free energy. And now we got to talk about enthalpy. Again, don't get confused with entropy. They're two different things, totally different things. Enthalpy is the heat content of a system when you're at a constant pressure. This, unfortunately, is very difficult to calculate. So scientists talk about the change in enthalpy, but you can't, it's difficult to calculate that. The pressure inside your body, the pressure outside your body, it, it changes. So it's hard to calculate that. So we just refer to um, the change in entropy, we just say total energy. And we refer to it as delta H. Delta H is enthalpy. Delta, the little triangle there, means change. So it's change in reactants to products. Okay. Then we have something called free energy. Free energy is energy that can do work when temperature and pressure are uniform, like a living cell. We have a system that keeps the pressure and the temperature normal. Granted, when you get sick and you have a fever, things change. But we have mechanisms to try and get it back to normal, right? Negative feedback. But overall, our, inside our bodies, the pressure in, let's say, our bloodstream is going to be constant, and our temperature in our body will be constant. So we refer to this as delta G, which is the change in free energy. We can talk more about delta G than delta H. I use the delta H to get me to teach the delta G. <coughs> So, if delta G is negative, less than zero, the reaction is spontaneous. It's just going to happen. If the delta G is zero or positive, so equal to zero or higher, then the reaction is not spontaneous. You're going to have to put some energy into it. So our equilibrium is a state of maximum stability. The most stable we can get, that's going to be equilibrium. That's what, we'll, that's what we want to go to. The most stable thing is going to keep us at equilibrium. So when a reaction, R-E-X-N is reaction, okay? So when a reaction is moving towards equilibrium, 
It's spontaneous and can perform work. Energy gets released. Okay? So, this little chart here kind of puts things together. You have more free energy, i.e., you have a delta G that's very high. It's going to be less stable. We want to make it stable. So this has a greater work capacity. So we want to get it where there's going to be less free energy, a lower G. That'll be more stable. But we need to do a spontaneous reaction to do that. Because we need energy to come off of a spontaneous reaction to go into a reaction that isn't spontaneous. We're going to use one reaction to release energy, we are then going to use that released energy to do some work so that we get things back stable. And that's what that is. We're going to see a lot of this in our cellular respiration. This is a so-called coupling reaction, where you've got to have something that's spontaneous and use the energy from a spontaneous reaction and couple it with a reaction that's not spontaneous, but it'll get you to stability. So, spontaneous change, you jump off of here, you got gravitational motion going on, right? You, we showed you that before. Spontaneous, it wants to be where a high concentration moves to a low concentration. Things that are a big, re a big product over here can easily break into smaller products. That's more spontaneous. You want to go from here to here, well, you've got to put energy into it. Like our Legos, you take a building that's made out of Legos, you can ask anybody to break it up. It's spontaneous. You can ask a two-year-old to break it up. You can ask a, an 80-year-old to break it up. There isn't much thought to it. You're not going to be using your noggin and releasing energy to do that. Or putting energy into it to think about how you can do it. But if you want to build that building, you're not going to ask a two-year-old to do that. You're not going to ask an 80-year-old to do that. Maybe that's Alzheimer's disease, right? Because you've got to put some work into it. So building things is not spontaneous. Breaking things up is. So we have something called an exergonic reaction. As the name implies, exer. It's going to release something. So products contain less energy than original reactants. Overall, this will release energy. So you take these two things over here, and you want to make two different things. Energy gets released. If energy gets released, it's an exergonic reaction. And this is spontaneous. It wants to do this. Okay? An endorgonic reaction, endo, you're something inside, you're putting something into it. In this case, products contain more energy than the original reactants. Overall, you have to put energy into this reaction. And it's not spontaneous. So you put energy into this reaction, these two reactants over here, Where's the energy here? It's stored in these products. And we could use these products for a reaction that needs energy. Does that make sense? Right? So we need to 
little foreshadowing here. We need to put energy, ATP, into certain reactions so that we have a lot more ATP later on here. We need to build a business. We have to invest money so that we can actually make the business that you're doing worthwhile doing it. You make more money off of it. Now, the evolution of more complex organisms does not violate the second law of thermodynamics. Things get messier and messier and messier. I understand that. But as an organism, we don't. One organism or, let's say, a collective amount of people together, in our system, it doesn't make it messier inside. Entropy or disorder or messiness may decrease in an organism, because we're very organized inside of us, but the universe's total entropy is going to get messier. Because you're putting more energy out there, right? The cheetah that's eating the, um, uh, the antelope has potential energy, but all that energy it's going to get him from one place to another. It's going to be simpler inside him. But most of that energy gets released as heat makes the universe messier. So organisms, if you think of it like this, organisms are islands of low entropy in an increasingly random universe. It's making the universe more messier, but the individuals are not. 